welcome to Ask the Expert. Welcome to Amy's Going Rogue episode of the Ask the Expert podcast, where I get to ask all the personal questions that you guys are interested in, that I am interested in, of our guest. Our guest, as you guys know from previous episode, is Dr. Jonathan Roberts, who is with the Bleeding and Clotting Disorders Institute in Peoria, Illinois. He is a hematologist, and he has hemophilia. Uh, Today's episode, we are going to hear about his personal story of hemophilia, what it was like growing up with hemophilia, what his childhood was like, and how that inspired him to become a physician. He has wonderful, wonderful comments and memories uh, about growing up with hemophilia, and he has a wonderful direction, I think, for young people who are interested in giving back to their community. I personally know so many teenagers and young adults that want to give back, they want to become Um, a part of the clinical community. And while hematology, going full-blown hematology, physician, medical school, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, I know everyone might not want to do that. He gives wonderful um, suggestions about how you can give back. And there are so many different avenues for you to fit in. So he is he is wonderful. I enjoyed our conversation so much. And I know you will as well. So please, 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 please grab yourself a cup of coffee. And let's have ourselves a personal conversation. I am your host, Amy Board. And welcome to part two of episode 36 of the Ask the Expert podcast. Dr. Roberts, welcome back to the podcast. We're so excited to have you with us. Um, We had such a wonderful conversation about becoming an expert in your bleeding disorder, your hemophilia. So I'd love to just jump right in and uh, ask you a little bit about your childhood, about growing up with hemophilia, and uh, we'll kind of go through um, your journey about how you became your own actual clinical legit expert. (laughs) So tell me what it was like growing up with hemophilia for you personally. I would categorize myself as an elder millennial. (laughs) I grew up in the 80s. Um, And so I was kind of in the thick of the crisis in the hemophilia community. Um, Unfortunately, you know, both of my uncles um, passed away from HIV. Um, And so my earliest childhood memories were in and out of ERs all the time. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, and so that really, you know, in those formative years just kind of shapes you as a person, right? Because that's a lot of your time and there was a lot of uncertainty. And, um, I remember, you know, my parents, you know, being, you know, kind of having hushed conversations I couldn't understand about what to do. Um, and so because of that time, um, you know, I have some, uh, chronic joint disease um, in my elbow and ankles, um, but I, I learned early on that that I still wanted to do stuff. I mean, it was always kind of that struggle of wanting to, you know, be um, a normal kid, right? So, um, so I pushed the envelope in that era of what I could do in sports. I played baseball and basketball, got a lot of injuries because of it, but I was also the compliant patient that was. Um, you know, treating bleeds right away for the most part. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and really, because I wanted to play, I wanted to do stuff, I wanted to be active. Um, so all those formative years, I don't know when it was, but, you know, when they start asking you in grade school what you want to be when you grow up, um, I just thought, you know, I want to help other people like me. And, um, and some of it was I want to be the one to tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't like being told what to do by by uh, the physician sometimes and trying to limit me. And I was and I was, um, you know, I, I mean, I was I was a smart kid. I did well in school, and so I'd figure out like, well, you know, before prophylaxis was a thing in the U.S., I was like, I should probably you know infuse before my baseball game if I want to be able to play baseball and not have a bleed. So I kind of started to do that on my own. And then as I moved into, you know, the junior high, high school years, I started to uh, find out more about what it took to become a doctor and just really pushed myself to do all those classes. And and ultimately, it was because of my HTC that I really learned the path to become a hematologist. So um, thankfully, in my early years, Dr. Andrew Weiss and Dr. Emily Chopik took, you know, good care of me, and I my joints are pretty good considering the era I lived in, um, but then uh, our now uh, medical director, CEO of, of uh, BCDI, was my hematologist at the time, Dr. Michael Tarantino. Um, and he, um, I remember I first met him, I was a senior in high school, and I said, um, 
you know, we were just kind of getting to know each other. And he was having that conversation that I talked about last time about, you know, the transition to independence. And I said, I really want to do what you do. And so he actually, um, when I was in high, you know, undergrad, provided some opportunities for me to get in the lab over the summer, you know, really kind of get my hands wet at the bench to, um, like, learn about some of the special coagulation tests. And then, you know, kind of the rest is is history. We kind of progressed through, you know, through all the different steps and, um, you know, worked hard to get into medical school and just put my nose to the grindstone and kept, uh, you know, um, doing the next thing, the next step, the next thing. Um, and then we, you know, I had always had a conversation with him over the years that, you know, when I get done with training, you know, cause, cause this was my local, this is my home HTC. This is where I wanted to be. It was home. And so we said, if it all works out and everything, then it'd be great if we could come back and work together. And then that's what ended up happening. So, um, you know, I had the benefit of in fellowship to train at the blood center, of Wisconsin and medical college, of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and, and, you know, train with people that wrote the textbooks, um, uh, doctors Joan Gill, Robert Montgomery, um, J. Paul Scott, others, um, Tom Abshire, um, and and just people that have really been instrumental in the field. And so I've just kind of made it, you know, it's been my life passion to to do this for a career. And so now it's really exciting to be able to kind of fulfill that dream and, and give back to, um, you know, to give back to the community, um, to to help lead an, an HTC and help patients navigate um, all those treatment uh, questions um, and, and life questions, really, um, and then be able to help, uh, you know, impact the community uh, on a, a national and global level um, is, is exciting as well. Do you remember uh, a particular bleed you had in those formative years that was kind of the wake-up call um, that you needed to treat before a basketball game? Um, do, do you tell us that story if you have one? Yeah, well, I mean, I can remember the worst, the worst. <laughs> so the thing is, I don't remember what joint it was. It was probably like my elbow or something. But I remember, I don't even know how old I was. I was probably, I don't know, seven years old, six years old, something like that. And it was, I remember it was on a Father's Day. And um, I was in the ER from... Uh, my dad was a pastor, and so it was after church, and I know I had a bleed, and so I went right after that to the ER, and um, I remember it was somewhere on the lines of like over 11 times that they had to stick me to get my factor. Um, oh. I remember, you know, being, um, you know, held down. I mean, that was kind of the routine when I was a kid, you know, all the medical staff and even my dad would, you know, you know, hold you down basically to um, to get the 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 stick so that you could get your factor. And so I remember, you know, kind of after going through that time, um, being like, man, that sucked, <laughs> you know, whatever I could, you know, however I thought about it then as a kid. And I was like, I don't want to do that forever. So I really, I really need to, uh, to figure out how to treat this better. And thankfully I was around 10 years old when I first, when I was able to infuse independently um, and thankfully some of our kiddos that do it are even younger than that now, but, um, but I was really kind of on the, 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 the front lines. Like I got to learn how to take care of this myself because you people don't know how to take care of me, <laughs> you know, like I got to be able to become an expert phlebotomist. I got to be able to stick myself because, um, I'm not going to have everyone hold me down and poke me all over. So, um, so yeah, I mean, those type of things, uh, change you. And then, um, you know, as I got older, I thought, I remembered what a bleed felt like, you know, really early on. So I was like, you know, take me to the ER, dad, I, I've got a bleed and, you know, so, um, so that just kind of shaped me. And then I was missing out on all the fun, you know, that all the other kids yeah. were having. So I was like, well, you know, if I don't take care of this now, even though it's not fun to go to the ER, then I can't play baseball this weekend. So, um, so then I just kind of, you know, it kind of developed from there. You mentioned your uncles um, and watching that and the tail end of the HIV crisis. What fear was instilled within you um, and how have you managed and overcome those feelings of, of fear or unease when it comes to treatment and, and uh, blood safety? Well, I think 
I guess thankfully back in that era, um, I didn't really know what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of remember, you know, my my mom in particular, you know, crying a lot when that would, would happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of those conversations that I was too young to understand. Um, but I think, you know, it, it was kind of this uncertain time. Um, and, and then definitely with, you know, with hepatitis after the fact, like I already have this chronic disease that's, you know, on, you know, it's not my fault that I have it. I was born this way. Um, and, uh, and now I got to have something else to deal with. Um, and, and, and thankfully I think, you know, where the treatment center and kind of paradigm I was under, um, you know, I, I think ultimately some of the physicians that worked with me early on saved my life because we didn't treat bleeds when I was really young, like a toddler, and they didn't tell my parents why, but it was because, you know, everyone back in the really early 80s was getting HIV. Um, so I went without treatment and just would ace wrap, you know, my elbow and just it would bleed until it would stop eventually. Um, and so... Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. I mean, not knowing if you're going to be able to grow up as into an adult as a child, that's a pretty, it can be a pretty scary thing. But I think yeah. by the time in my development that I got to the point of really understanding was when thankfully, you know, recombinant product came out and it was like, you know, this is a shining light from heaven <laughs> that we finally have something that we can, we can get that's safe. And everyone felt this new comfort, like, okay, now I'm, I'm safe. It's in the lab, it's controlled. Um, and so that really kind of, I think, that whole journey um, really, you know, helped shape to where I am today. So personally, what has it been like to be a patient and a physician on the cusp of this paradigm shift in treatment that we're on right now? Yeah, well, I feel like I'm on the front lines and I, I, I bring a lot to the conversation. Um, I guess it's kind of cool that I get to be in some conversations that other patient groups don't get to have, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I get to say. I get to sit at the table with some of the other people that are, you know, thought leaders and, and people that are developing these drugs. And, and I say, now, hey, wait a minute. Like, you need to think about this different aspect. You need to think about that. Um, you know, you don't know what it's like. <laughs> I do. Mm. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I challenge um, thought sometimes, but I think that's a that's a good thing. That's how we grow as a community. For young people out there that are budding science nerds, what are some of just because, you know, I remember when I was a teenager, I had no idea the vast, you know, um, array of job options. <laughs> um, you just kind of go where you see a path. But what are some of the other fields that people can um, explore if they want to give back to their community? I personally know so many teenagers that, you know, want to go into nursing or want to go into physical therapy um, to give back to the hemophilia, you know, Von Willebrand's community. So what are some, what are some fields um, that people might not think of in the clinical space? Yeah. Well, in the, in the clinical space, I mean, I, I would en encourage young people to look at your, your HTC team and say like, mm. who do you have a good relationship with? And what could you see yourself doing? What part of this do you really like? Um, and then I think outside the HTC, if they get, they go to some, like go to, you know, the annual bleeding disorder conference with NHF or mm. sit in some other lectures, you know, have those experiences and, and see what else is available and out there. Um, and then, and then ask questions. So, um, you know, not everyone is, is, uh, you know, an extrovert and wants to go, you know, meet lots of people, but get outside your comfort level or, or, you know, if they need their parents or even if they have a good relationship with someone with their HTC, like if one of my patients came to me and said, I'm interested in this, can you help me? I would definitely, you know, help connect them with people I knew in the field to help them um, further their interests and maybe explore some different career options. So definitely non-science things are available um, and I think, you know, your your group and, and what you're doing now with this podcast is is definitely a testament to that. You know, you're 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 using media in, in a way to really advance the community and bring voices to people that they couldn't otherwise hear or interact with. Um, and then then I think, you know, if you're really ultra science nerd, um, I mean, you could you could work at the bench your whole life. I mean, you could work for industry um, and help be in the lab developing these drugs. Um, so there's really a, a wide spectrum of what you'd want to do. Um, but, but if you, if you want to like get involved, I just encourage, um, 
you know, teenagers, young adults, to just ask questions and try stuff, you know, um, go get involved in something um, and see if you like it. And if you, if you see that you could advance, you know, in that, then, then you found it. And if not, then go try something else. It, it's, it, it's fine to take your time. Do you hear that, science nerds? You could be on the bench your whole life. You could. You really could. You could. And I and I and I would have, you know. Um, but I I really I like taking care of patients too much, so I like to have a balance where. Um, and actually, I'm at a point where I wish I had more time to be in the lab now, <laughs> because mm-hmm. because everything else is so busy. But um, but I still am, you know. I still I still get, do get in the lab from time to time. But uh, yeah, it's um. There, there's a lot that you can do with this career in this in this in this space. That's great. Um, have you found any need to adapt any part of your job because of your hemophilia, because of your target joints? Has there been a need to do any adaptation in your day to day, being on your feet or or something like that? Yeah, I'll tell you when I'm on service in the hospital and we round at uh, three different hospitals here um, uh, in Central Illinois. Um, so I can, you know, I put in way over 10,000 steps in a day and we've got chronic hemophilic arthropathy. That's not good. Um, but, uh, well, I guess it is good if you can do it. But, um, you know, managing chronic pain um, it can be challenging. And I also kind of up my treatment schedule when I'm on those more physically intense weeks. Um, and so, I, you know, I have had bleeds. Um, I have been known to round at the hospital using a knee scooter because I got an ankle bleed. Um, <laughs> but but um, I also, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, this was a challenging thing in fellowship is that I'm surrounded by hematologists, so I have to take care of myself. If I've had a bad bleed, I stay home. I take care of it because I need to be doing this, you know, for the next 30, 40 years. So. Um, how has having hemophilia, how has it helped or hindered your medical practice in, in relation to, to dealing with patients? Yeah, I think it, I mean, it's definitely helped because, um, Mm -hmm. even patients have various different types of, um, medical problems in the hospital. Um, I found even when, so I used to practice, I'm a hematologist oncologist, so I used to do oncology. Um, I used to take care of all the kids in the cancer wing. And I found that even being able to share with a family um, that, you know, not that I shared with everybody, but if the moment seemed right, um, having a chronic disease and going through a chronic battle like like childhood cancer, um, Mm -hmm. it resonated with people. And so being able to say, you know, your walk is different than mine, but I've had um, lots of health challenges as well. And, you know, let's walk through this together. Um, so I think it's, 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 I've only seen it as a positive thing. And if you frame it in the right context and if you share in the right context, I think it really can be uplifting for the patients. So um, to close, what is your advice to young people with bleeding disorders out there um, starting out, wanting to follow their dreams? What, what advice um, or guidance can you offer? I think this kind of goes back to, you know, becoming your own advocate. Um, so let people know that you're interested is step one, right? So find out what you're interested, let people know, and then just start asking, um, start asking questions. Um, whoever you have a good relationship with at the HTC, ask questions, or if some of your HTC is not giving you answers, um, you know, reach out to forums like this. I mean, um, I'm happy to, you know, have people, um, ask questions and, you know, respond with email and try to point people in the right direction. Um, so I think, I think they just need to have that kind of spark within them that, yeah, I think I could do this and then have a community of people around them that will help motivate them along the way. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your time. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your personal story with us. What a treat. We just appreciate it. We hope to have you back on the podcast. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. And that is all for episode 36 of the Ask the Expert podcast series. Hey, you guys, we will be back next month with another expert interview.